Welcome back to the boathouse. This week, Alex tackles the last step on the mizzen mast. The bottom portion that's going in the boat will get varnished, and the upper portion that holds the rigging will get several coats of an epoxy-based primer. Thanks in advance for subscribing to the channel, hitting the like button, and a big shout out to all of our Patreon supporters whose ongoing contributions make all of this possible. Sealer is now on and dry, and it's looking really good. Um, so now it's time for the actual varnish. So we are putting on the Total Boat Gleam. Um, so before I do that, we're gonna take light scouring pad, just scour this up, give it a little bit of texture, really, really light. And then I'm gonna put on the varnish and that'll get brushed on. With the bright work done, it was time to prep the upper portion of the mast for the paint. Alex worked to build a new way of turning the mast and holding it up for that process. And helping Alex is a new volunteer, Greg. And I'd just like to say thanks to Greg for all the footage you took while you were there. It's always fun to see the project through someone else's lens. What I gotta do is try to get the mast suspended a little bit so that we have it off of these supports because I'm not going to be able to paint from underneath. Um, and since this is already varnished, the ideal situation is going to be to get something like this set up so that I can then put this piece underneath it with some carpeting so that it can lay on that. And on that end, I think we're going to put a bit of webbing around the very tip, which is why I put that disc over there. When I'm painting, I'll be able to come back over here and grab this and just turn it so then I can get to underneath. It's gonna, is it roll? Yeah, yeah let's see what it does. Okay. I think, I think that'll stay. I'm gonna put a stop right here and I think we'll be good. But I think if we leave it, we'll be good. <laughs> All right. This has already been sanded, but before we put on the coat of paint, we need to uh, rough it up a little bit more. So we're gonna take a little bit of 80 grit sandpaper and just kind of give it a quick wipe down. And then we're gonna have to clear all that um, sawdust. That'll all keep the paint from adhering, so I gotta get that off. So this looks like a lot of uh, alcohol, but we really need the space for the cloth to go in and be able to have some extra so that the particulates can come off the cloth. So the other thing that people typically think of when they think of wooden spars is bright finish. Um, so the bright finish would be like a varnish like we did on the base of the mast over here. So one of the pros of having some bright work is for all the fasteners that are in the spars, you can see those and you can see if there's any water intrusion and you can deal with that immediately if you happen to notice it. The downside is that one, it's very UV um, sensitive and you really need to upkeep it. And to upkeep it, we would have to go aloft and you need to sand it and you need to wipe it and then you need to apply more coats of varnish. Um, so with paint, we're going with the practicality of it. So with the paint, we're gonna put on this epoxy primer. It seals everything underneath. And then on top of that, we'll put any enamel coat that we want, whatever color we want. 
And then at any point, we just need to make sure that we upkeep the paint and it's gonna be a lot less work than um, upkeeping the varnish. It's a lot less coats uh, that need to be done in the long run. Um, so we're gonna be going aloft a lot less. With the paint, we're gonna to need to put on uh, a couple of coats of the primer. So it's gonna be probably actually three to four coats. We're gonna be using a roller. Um, and all of that stuff is listed on Jamestown Distrib Distributors website. And the reason I say that is because if you look on the cans, a lot of the stuff for wooden boats, tip, it often feels like we are just not considered. I mean, wooden boats are a little bit less of the mainstream at this point, so it's to save space, they're usually not mentioned on here. So if you look at this can, it doesn't mention that it's okay for wood, but it really is. So we had a call with Jamestown Distributors and they told us to check out the um, technical data sheets. And if you see on the technical data sheets, there's all the information that you need and they have all the space that they want. So you can see exactly what you need to do for wood, for fiberglass, for metal, whatever. So when we checked it out, there's all that information. Um, not to mention that they have their whole tech department that you can call and they're always available. They're super friendly, really ready to help. And our contact Kristen also mentioned, uh, mentioned to us that they're working on rolling out QR codes that they're gonna have on the cans. So you can scan those and it'll take you immediately to the proper technical data sheet for whatever you're using. So that's really a bonus. All right. Uh. So, the paint's mixed. Uh, it's gonna sit up there for a little bit, and we'll talk about that. Um, but there's some pretty heavy solvents in there, and there's some chemicals, so we're wearing these uh, respirators so that we don't harm our lungs. Um, so we're taking a little break. We're gonna be down here. Now, the reason we're taking a little break is because the two parts, once they're mixed, they need to go through an induction period. So the paint actually needs to sit for 15 minutes while that chemical reaction gets started. And you wanna do that before you use the reducer. That means before you use the paint thinner that they uh, send with it. And with this kind of paint, it's a little thick, so you're automatically gonna get some texture and uh, we're not gonna worry about that right now. These coats are just coats to seal. And then we're gonna put on a coat and it's gonna level a little bit, but not very much. We're gonna have some texture. We're gonna put another coat on that. And then once all of the coats are on there, that gets sanded down and it's gonna be a smooth finish. And then you can put on your uh, enamel paints. There's different amounts that you wanna do for whether you're using a brush or whether you're using different kinds of rollers. And that's gonna be that coat that I was talking about, like how thick it needs to be. Um, and judging it by eye. They basically have some uh, guidelines for what you want to use. So if you're using a quarter inch nap or a three eight inch nap or a three sixteen inch nap um, roller, it really depends or how much you're leaving with your brush. So they tell you whether you want to put on two or five coats. Um, in our case, it's going to be two to three coats. So we're going to shoot for three coats, hopefully. So what we're going to do is we're going to put on that first coat. And by the time we reach the end of the mast, um, in this weather, it's probably gonna be already dry enough. Um, and we're gonna do a dryness test. It's gonna be a thumbprint test. So we're gonna take our glove off and I'm gonna stick my thumb on it. And if I pull it away and there's no paint on my thumb and I look and my thumbprint is in the paint, then I'm good to go to put another coat on there. If I put my thumb down and there's paint, obviously it's not ready. And if I put my thumb down and there's no paint but no thumbprint, it's already too cured for me to put another coat and I gotta wait for it to dry a bit. And then I'm gonna have to sand it with the 60 grit again to give it some more tooth for it to bite to. So we really wanna make sure that we're working in that window. And for, uh, in terms of like varnish and things like that or epoxy coating, this is what we would call hot coating. So basically what you're doing is you're getting the paint or the varnish laid and then almost fully cured, but it's chemically ready to bind to something else. And so when you put that next coat on, they actually adhere to each other really, really well. So that's really what we want to hit is those three coats going on with that hot coat. Um, so that's what we're going to shoot for. Mm, it's still a little bit. But... Yeah. Oh boy. It's only in the thick spots. All right, I think we're good to go.
Can you hold up three fingers to say third coat? Third coat. <laughs> three <laughs> fingers. Three fingers. <laughs> Good enough. All right. So Steve just got back, and we're going to take a break to let this dry. So since we can't have a Kiva in here because of the fumes, we're going to go give him some biscuits and give him a little loving. Yeah. Can you sit? Sit. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Look at that. Gentle. You want another one? Can you sit? Oh, you're such a good boy. Hey, buddy. Oh, good sniffing. <laughs> Look at that Akiva hole. Planning an escape. Whoa. Whoa. What? You found me out. Oh, look at that. Are you going to China? Are you going to escape? Are you just dig <laughs> under the fence? You're digging under the fence? Yeah. yeah. If you go look, I mean, under the platform and stuff, and sometimes he digs a hole and then starts digging another hole and inadvertently fills in the first one with his excavation work. <laughs> Hi, my name is Greg Cheney, and I live in Juneau, Alaska, and I came down to uh, Acorn and Arabella to just revel in the project. It's uh, been a, a long time viewer and uh, I've just got so much respect for this project. It's hard to put into words, but I did have a few questions because I have been watching and, and some things have been going a little differently than I had expected. And so I thought I'd ask Steve and Alex, since you're here uh, about the project. And, and one of my primary questions was your design build philosophy, because when I was first watching this, I saw you guys pouring the lead keel, super traditional, a wood frame boat, local planks, milling them yourself. You know, I hadn't seen this ever, you know, for any boat project. So I thought, boy, these guys are hardcore traditionalists. And then you said, we're, we're going with the gaff rig. And I thought, yes, okay, we're really on the traditional path now. You know, I was wondering if they were gonna have electricity on the boat. And um, then I saw the plans from the 30s. I thought, oh, it must be a 1930s boat. And then you start talking about maybe, maybe not having a water maker and stuff. And I was like, wait, whoa, whoa, this is, this is very different than what I was thinking. So, um, so can you enlighten me as to what is the design build? How are you proceeding? And what, yeah, what's, what's the philosophy here? Oh, we just got one of those magic eight balls, and you just shake it, and it tells you what to do. Um, <laughs> Wooden boat, damn it. All right, I guess we'll do that. It's kind of Mad Lib style. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blanks. Um, I don't know, so building the, like, traditional wooden hull was always a dream. So I don't like working with fiberglass, really. Um, not super huge on the glues. Uh, metal work, but building a metal boat has no appeal. So there was part of that is uh, just the being able to go out into the woods, which we have, and murder the trees and bring them out and slice them into boards and build them into a boat. The only really way to do that is to build a more traditional style boat. Um, so then it went to what style plans and trying to figure out what boat to build has if you're looking through all of the years and all of the designers, you know, they describe it as like picking out what car to build if you had every model, make, and manufacturer through the entirety of history. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of what it's like picking a boat. Only boats last longer than cars in history, so you've got yeah. even more choices. Just, yeah. Yeah. And you look at, there's hundreds of designers, and designers have done hundreds of boats. It, it's staggering. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, decided to pick a designer. Okay. and really liked Atkin's philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was like, all right, we'll look at Atkin boats. And then came across the Ingrid and the description of that and like the, just the stable, heavy displacement, double under, really comfortable, really uh, sea kindly, go yes. wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so that held great appeal. And then after that, it's the goal is to get on the boat and go voyage and travel and explore and go to some really wild remote places. Uh, so for any other design philosophy setup, it's all tailored around a cruising liveaboard to go to these wild places and do these wild things. Um, so if water makers make sense, great. Solar panels make sense, great. Uh, we'll do modern rigging, we'll do modern sails, we'll do modern LED lights. 
Modern rigging for a gaff rig. Modern rigging yes. for a gaff rig. <laughs> With yes. dead eyes. With dead eyes. So, mm-hmm. yep. yeah, not quite so modern. <laughs> no, but we'll do, we'll probably do fiber standing rigging. Um, all of the running rigging will definitely be modern nylon. We won't be doing the cotton sails as mm-hmm. the plans designed. Okay. Um, but we will have a hundred year old binnacle from Victoria and yeah. a manual windlass on the foredeck and a bunch of oddball stuff like that. But basically, it's we're looking at everything that exists and all of the possible options from what they had in the 1800s to the latest and greatest, and just kind of going around and cherry picking and saying, you know, that makes sense for our needs here, and uh, so that's kind of the design philosophy. It's so whatever seems like it's going to get the the best long term liveaboard cruising boat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then. As for the construction stuff that we're using, like again, it's whatever makes the most sense to use. So we could make our own square rivets. And so like everyone's like, oh wow, they're going that traditional and making their own rivets. But on the other hand, that's what was cheaper for us and what was available. But it's also like reusing Victoria's knees and her spars and things like that. So yeah. I think instead of like calling it a restoration either, because we're not restoring a boat, but no. we're kind of picking pieces from different boats that we can use and that aren't done with their life yet yeah and oh. that's super traditional yeah yeah I mean, well, they would build they would build a boat and sure, they would get yeah. like maybe 20 years out of it and then yeah. they would set it on fire on the beach and they would pick up all the fasteners <laughs> and they would go put them in another boat you'd strip the rigging you'd strip what usable timbers you cut off it right um and in boat building innovation is the oldest tradition yeah so can we talk about the knees for a moment? Because it's a yeah. it's a passion of mine or a fascination. I don't know which you say, but uh, there's something about naturally grown uh, timbers that are curved yeah. that is so uncommon in the modern world. And we're so used to as modern people, you buy straight things and then you put it in clamps and you bend it or you mm-hmm. buy it like formed in that shape. But it's so rare to see somebody going out into basically the wild, like you did, pull a tree out of the ground, literally, uh, hose it off or pressure wash it off, <laughs> and then hack it up with a chainsaw and then plane it down and turn it into this beautiful and extremely functional piece of, of boat architecture. I mean, it's both a piece of sculpture and a piece of uh, functional uh, you know, boat structure. So. Uh, and these are two very different things because one is from an old boat and one is from your farm, right? True. Yep. So could you talk about that a little bit? Because yeah, well, Alex did the hackmatack knees. Yeah, I mean, we had salvage all those out of Victoria, and they looked a little bit rough on the outside, but as soon as you cleaned them up, and they look, I mean, they look fine. And so with a little bit of extra material on there to take out some of the rot spots, I mean, they'll last however long we need them to. So last. they're about a hundred years old now. Yeah. Yeah. And like Steve said, wow. those are hackmatack, so those are a little bit different than what we cut out too, which were oak knees. Yeah, because so the, the, when you say different, you mean different species of wood. Yes. Yeah, Variety. so the tr- traditionally knees are from hackmatack, larch, tamarack, all the same tree. Okay. Um, and they grow very frequently in bogs. Okay. So the trunk comes down, and because they're in bogs with really unstable soil, they send out these huge buttress roots that okay. go way out. And because it's a bog, there's no rocks, there's no dirt. Uh, so you can literally go out there and you can cut the tree down and you can take your chainsaw and just kind of fish around in there and cut the roots and pop the thing out and pull all of the, you know, mm-hmm. the bog off it and you're, you're good to go. Uh, cutting stumps out of our glacial till here is a completely different nightmare of an animal. Yeah. Um, so we got the back hoe, and that really opened up the knees. We wouldn't have done mm-hmm. them if we hadn't picked up the hoe. Okay. Um, but it let us get the stumps out of the ground with a reasonable amount of time and effort. And then after that, yeah, like you said, we just looked at the stumps and where the best curves were and started carving away. But the tricky thing with the oak is, he said, it grows in this glacial till here, and they'll actually grow around and encapsulate rocks. Yeah. So you'll look at it, and you're like, well, that's a beautiful piece of timber, and you'll start oh, cutting into man. it, and it'll, I mean, there'll just be a boulder in the middle of it, oh. or there might be a pebble in the middle of it. But yeah. either way, it just messes up your chainsaw blades. Sure. Sure. Um, the yeah. chains get smoked. Um, so it was a lot of work. They're really, really tough to get. But like you said, they're, they're very beautiful. They are insanely strong. And the oak roots and the hackmatack roots exist in the wet ground. Uh-huh. So, so if you think about, like, you cut down an oak tree 
and you come back 10 years later and go kick that stump, you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> like, still that thing is still there. <laughs> yeah. Um, which bodes very, very well for, for their existence in the boat. They'll be significantly more rot resistant than just oak timber, which sure. is already a quite resistant wood. Sure. So basically, I guess for me, the, the passion that I feel for the project comes from your passion of you're building something from local materials, very local, like your own. I mean, some of your, like the, the spar, the main, the main mast is going to be something that your great-grandfather planted? My great-grandfather planted. Okay, yeah. so you harvested that tree. Yeah. And you're going to make a planted bird mouth. Planted over 90 years ago. Yeah, yeah, you're going to make a bird's mouth mast out of it. Yep. And then you're going to take all of this timber and you're going to be sailing around the world maybe not literally around the world but well, hopefully literally potentially the world. Yeah. yeah but to great destinations around the world and you'll be riding on the timber that came from your own land yeah i yeah. mean that is uh like i was saying earlier it's like a tangible poetry come back next friday to see the shutter planks going in we'll see you again next week and as always thanks for watching so uh yeah this is definitely one of the most incredible projects i have ever witnessed the idea of going and taking trees from your land and building a boat that you could sail anywhere in the world it's pretty audacious uh, and in this era of the internet where you just you know Look on a website, pick what you want, a couple days or even less, it shows up at your door. Uh, that kind of instant gratification. This is sort of the far opposite extreme. It, it takes a, an amount of fortitude that is hard to uh, fathom uh, to do something like this. I think a lot, of, a lot of people dream of things like this. A very few people start, and I don't know if anyone uh, I've never known anyone that actually finished something this intense.